Afternoon, everybody. I think we'll get started. Looks like the cloud recording has succeeded. So thanks, everybody, for joining today. Uh, we wanted to try to feature a little bit more of a science-focused story since we've been talking a little bit about infrastructure and, and technology for the past couple of weeks. Uh, and Kurt Dodds from the University of Hawaii was kind enough to give us some of his time, uh, especially since it's early for him over in Hawaii still. Uh, but we wanted to uh, revisit a topic that I think that Kurt talked to this community about a couple of years ago, which was how do we handle trying to share all of this great astronomy data that we're capturing from big telescopes that are located uh, in the islands as well as across the world. So we've worked with uh, Kurt for a number of years on a number of different projects. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to him to talk a little bit about some of the new things that he's been working on. Thank you, Jason. Uh, aloha from Hawaii. Uh, yeah, it's 10 a.m., so it's not terribly early. but uh, And we're having, uh, I see Chris is on the call, but uh, we're having cold weather for Hawaii. So uh, every, if you go to the office, everybody's talking about how cold it is, which is probably in the 70s in the daytime. So. Um, yeah, I, I I think well before COVID, actually, I had uh, talked about uh, really this this problem of uh, big data and astronomy, um, and I've kind of uh, maybe got. I'll talk about. I I think through through this talk, I'll talk about the problems that still remain, but also some some avenues for progress and progress that that's being made. Uh, so everything everywhere all at once all the time, uh, democratizing astronomy, big data. Yeah. So everything, all of the extra galactic objects. So if we look beyond the Milky Way galaxy, what do we see, right? In this picture, you have foreground stars that are part of the Milky Way galaxy, but we look through that and we see our closest neighbor, the Andromeda galaxy. Um, so the Andromeda galaxy might be your first stop as you leave the Milky Way, but, but as we look out, there are uh, literally billions of galaxies beyond the Milky Way galaxy and quasars. And, and so on. And then galaxies form clusters of galaxies. So these are the structures and, and objects that we see when we look out beyond our galaxy, extra galactic. Galactic, that means what do we see when we look inside of the Milky Way galaxy? What kind of structures and things do we see? Things like clusters of stars, things like nebulosity that you see, you know, clouds of gas, um, and so on. And uh, exoplanets, planet, uh, planets going around other stars. Uh, that are in the Milky Way. And then finally, we can look within our solar system, the sun, the planets, asteroids, comets, trans-Neptunian objects that are very distant out past the, uh, the, the planets, out past Pluto. Uh, so these are all areas of study, right? So everything in astronomy, we're looking at all of these things everywhere. Uh, we have one of really our bailiwick, one of our strong things that we do here at, at the University of Hawaii at the Institute for Astronomy, where I work, is we do all sky surveys. Uh, we have three notable surveys, uh, PanSTARS, which has the largest telescopes uh, doing our surveys, which means that the uh, larger telescope means you can see uh, more of those distant galaxies. You can see out into space uh, deeper and deeper, farther away from uh, from from us. Uh, and of course, the purpose, PanSTARRS is funded uh, to search for killer asteroids. If you saw the Netflix movie, Don't Look Up, that's what we do um, every day. Literally, I work with people whose job title is planetary defense specialist. Uh, so who knew that was a job, but it is. And uh, and 3 pi stradian means PanSTARRS is uh, from our position here on Maui, uh, where the two telescopes reside, is able to uh, image uh, three quarters of the entire visible sky, right? Think of it as a sphere. We can see three fourths of that sphere from Hawaii because we're so far south. Um, the other two uh, surveys, Atlas and Assassin, uh, uh, actually observe the entire sphere, the four pi steridian sphere. Um, but at uh, their telescopes are smaller, so they don't see as far out into space. Uh, they're trying to solve other problems. Atlas is also protecting us from uh, killer asteroids, but the size of the asteroid would just take out a city as opposed to taking out kind of everything that lives and breathes. Um, so PanSTARRS is focused on the, the really large objects. 
Atlas is fo focused on smaller objects, the size of a bus to something smaller than a city block, football field maybe size. Um, and they, every night, uh, these surveys image a lot of the sky. Atlas, every two nights, images the entire sphere. So every two nights, they see everything in their visual, in their magnitude range. Um, and then it, the next two nights again, and the next two nights again. And the result of this is a very large data set um, that's uh, got you know, many, many images of the same things, which allows astronomers to do something called stacking, where they can add those images together and improve signal to noise and extract you know, more and better, higher quality data uh, from those images. And one of the challenges that we have with both PanStars and Atlas is they're charged with finding asteroids. They aren't charged or funded with doing science, you know, doing general astronomy science on this data. And, uh, and so we have a little bit of a mismatch between the products that these uh, projects produce and the potential science that could be done. Uh, and this ultimately relates to accessing this data. Okay, so yeah, uh, everywhere. Uh, there's, there's another sense of everywhere, not looking out everywhere, but distributing our data everywhere on Earth. Um, and this is a lot of what I want to talk about, is how do we democratize? How do we provide roughly equal access or equal opportunity, let's say, to scientists, uh, certainly within the United States, um, but even uh, more broadly than that? Um, right now, uh, <laughs> If you look at the bits fl uh, flowing, uh, the astronomy-related bits flowing out of Hawaii, you know they're going all over the world. Um, so astronomy is an international, uh, you know, community, and Hawaii uh, plays a really important role in providing data. Um, okay, all at once, and uh, you know this is, I think, where big data enters into the equation. Uh, the uh, the results of deep learning and you know, what's commonly referred to as AI, you know, a, a branch of machine learning that that uh, because of scaling laws, the more data that you provide and the uh, more capacity that the model has for uh, represent, you know, parameters space that represents uh, uh, um, parameters, uh, you, you get better and better performance the more data that you have you can argue, but there's a limit within some limit, but but nonetheless, uh, this is why we see that if you you know train a uh, a large language model with more parameters for longer on a bigger set of data, you get an even better large language model. And uh, in the same sense, if you train a neural network on all of the galaxies and quasars, 1.8 billion galaxies and quasars in the PanStars uh, data set. Um, you know, you you can do a lot. So, you know, the, one of the, the powerful things about modern machine learning neural networks in particular is what you can do with the population statistics, what you can do with all the data. Um, and so here, uh, PS1 STRM and WISE PS1 STRM are two papers uh, uh, that we did where we took PanStars observations in five filters, right? And then we took uh, satellite-based observations of the same objects with precision uh, spectroscopy from which you can measure or estimate the distance, the Z, the distance in Z away. So how far away is this galaxy or quasar from the Milky Way, from the Earth? Um, so not just X, Y in a map, but Z. And we, we have the ability to then um, train a model on the galaxies and quasars for which we have both PanStars five filters and satellite spectroscopy, train a model, and now use that model to make predictions for all of the PanStars galaxies for which we don't have uh, satellite-based spectral observations. Um, and, and this is a powerful, a, a good demonstration of machine learning when you have access to all the data. However, <laughs> you know the devil's in the details and this, these, these papers actually required us, took us six months to extract. Most of that time was not training the machine learning model, but extracting the data from the database and cross-matching the data between the two, um, between the two uh, catalogs. Uh, and, and the reality is that 
if you use the tools that are publicly available to the astronomy community, this is an intractable problem. You, you can't do this cross match. The tools won't permit you to do that. And so it's very undemocratic, can only be done by us because we're sitting here close to the data with direct access to the data and others would just not be able to do this uh, all the time. <laughs> so as I mentioned with Atlas and Assassin and PanStars, you know, every night they're just churning through, looking at the sky, sucking in, you know, all the bits, all the photons. Um, they have, uh, in particular, PanStars just has the two telescopes on Haleakala here in Maui. Um, however, Atlas has a telescope on the big island of Hawaii, on Ma uh, Haleakala in Maui, and then in Chile and in South Africa. And so because they have coverage in the Southern Hemisphere, they can fill in the whole four pi steradian sky. And because of the difference in longitude, they're observing every moment of every day somewhere, uh, barring bad weather. And the same for Assassin. So they have telescopes located all around the globe, full coverage, northern and southern hemisphere. So all the time, Atlas and Assassin are sucking in uh, data from the sky. And of course, over time, this creates very large data sets. Um, all of these are uh, it, uh, greater than a petabyte, and PanStars in particular is... Uh, around six or seven petabytes now. Then we also have all the time space-based astronomy. So, you know, we hear about James Webb Space Telescope a lot since it's kind of the latest thing, but uh, there are other telescopes, TESS, uh, WISE, you know, Surveyor, you know, these telescopes that are looking out away from the sun into the, you know, darkness of space. Uh, and they, of course, don't have any atmosphere or air to, uh, corrupt the uh, the images. Uh, so they have a uh, very high quality data. Um, and then you if you're doing solar astronomy, you can turn your satellite around and have it point at the sun all the time and collect data from the sun. So there's this uh, time domain component in astronomy, especially you know more recently, uh, where uh, satellites can also be observing all the time. Uh, so here here's our uh, sort of telescope assets uh, on a map. You see both Assassin and Atlas have telescopes in South Africa and in Chile. Um, Assassin has one in Texas, and we have all have them here in Hawaii. Uh, this is, again, just uh, to show you, this is a, a gigapixel image that was produced uh, from PanStars data. And the crazy thing is that, you know, here we're zoomed way out. Uh, you see the dust in the Milky Way, uh, the big arch there uh, is essentially looking if you pictured a Frisbee, right, uh, of course, this is distorted, but uh, the Milky Way arms with the uh, arms of the galaxy, this, all the concentration of Milky Way stars and the gases are all in a plane. Uh, and then uh, hopefully you can see my cursor, but right here is the Andromeda galaxy that I showed you a picture of uh, right at the beginning. So that is the one thing in this whole picture that is not part of the Milky Way galaxy and that you're actually looking beyond our Milky Way galaxy out to see something else that's visible here. But because this is a gigapixel uh, image, you could zoom in. <laughs> I, I need to update this with that capability, uh, but you could just zoom, 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 right? Until you have a very high magnification image of you know the Andromeda galaxy or, or other objects that are uh, very far away. And, uh, and the point here is, you know, we're, we're, we're sucking in photons uh, with the, these are the PanStars telescopes um, and, uh, up atop uh, Haleakala. And uh, the telescopes have cameras. The cameras turn photons into electrons. Uh, you know, we're kind of familiar with this. Uh, the electrons, you know, get converted back to photons, um, you know, at the, at the switches and uh, run across optical fiber where they then hit another device, turns into electrons, turns back into photons. Ultimately, on the right here, they hit our data center and uh, get processed by a cluster and uh, get stored as you know little bumps on spinning hard drives or, or what have you. Um, and then, of course, our challenge that I want to talk about is, well, how do we get these little bumps that have data um, to the science community uh, who can um, you know, use them? And uh, here's where we start to run into some uh, some challenges. Uh, the 
PANSTAR's data is archived at the Mikulski Archive for Space Telescopes, Space Telescope Science Institute at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. So initially, PANSTAR's took their first uh, set of data, uh, put it on hard drives, put it on a boat, sailed through the Panama Canal, sailed to Baltimore, and then they uh, forklifted those hard drives into the data center and you know, hooked them up to a database that's now exposed through a web interface to the world. So you can log into that web interface and you can run a query. And there's kind of two components to this archive. There's a catalog that's about 150 terabyte database that has all the uh, metadata about the objects, galaxies, quasars, stars, what have you. Um, so you can run queries against this 150 terabyte database and then you get back a result and that result will either have a set of uh, you know, data points about the objects that you queried, uh, or it can maybe return uh, the path to an image, uh, and then you would do another call to obtain the image. And uh, the system, um, when you run a query, has a, oh, here, here's uh, where not just uh, the PanSTARS archive, but other astronomy archives are located around the world. So um, some of the challenges we have, right, are that, that this uh, archive was not, was designed for classical computing. So like a database query, I would say is you know, classical. And even in astronomy, where you might say, um, uh, you know, find me the small set of objects that meet the, this very specialized criteria, right? So I'll have a, 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 a search constraint that limits the results to a small set, and then I get that small set back. But it, it, the system is not designed to support uh, result sets that are extremely large. And in fact, the system itself imposes size limits uh, on your queries. And if you submit a query that produces too large of a result, then they just cancel the query and you can't run it. Um, also, the archive <laughs> archives often have you know, gig, gigabit links um, the Mikulski archive actually upgraded uh, with some pressure from us to 10 gig. Um, and yet uh, they, you know, right now we're, we're actually involved in, in transferring uh, 800 terabytes of data from, uh, from Space Telescope Science Institute's archive. And you know, through the 10 gig link, it's, uh, it's definitely a limiting factor um, where the rest of our infrastructure is all 100 gig connected and uh, capable of higher bandwidth. So, and then the, we run into this last mile connection problem, you know, everywhere at the telescopes, uh, transferring from uh, from other uh, universities or, or research locations where, you know, the last mile may not be uh, designed for transferring large data. And then this is all exacerbated with exponential growth in the size of these data sets because we're looking everywhere, you know, all the time, all at once. Um, and so these data sets are, are getting really large. So, uh, for example, this uh, uh, PanSTARS archive, um, you can run a query, but you're limited to a three gigabytes in you know, your result sets. And what this often leads to then is that you have to write a script and, a, and it partitions the query into little small bytes, right? And then you have to grab your three gigabytes of results and then you run the next query and the next query and the next query. Um, not an efficient way to, to collect, you know, Data at scale. Um, so, you know, here's some of the documentation from this uh, interface, and you'll see, you know, if you modify this script to download images in multiple threads, do not use more than 10 threads for the download. Uh, you know, the system will, will break if too many people try to use it um, at scale at once. And uh, this is another great example. This was a uh, a master's degree thesis that I ran across where it's really interesting. He's trying to do uh, machine learning on PanSTARS galaxies. Uh, he thought, oh, you know, I'll get, I'll get the, you know, the image cutouts, we call them postage stamps um, of each galaxy. And then I'll train a machine learning model on these galaxies. Um, but the standard full resolution lossless format is called FITS files in astronomy. Uh, he had to abandon, you know, lossless uh, FITS files because they're too big and it would take too long to download. It would have taken them 
over a year to download the FITS files. Uh, so he used JPEG instead, and he used a smaller uh, scale down. So he also lost resolution um, by reducing it to 120 by 120 pixels. And as it was, it took him 62 days to you know, partition his query to get uh, this set of uh, JPEG files. So, so this sort of shows the barrier <laughs> to, let's say, you know, a citizen science or uh, you know, a grad student uh, who isn't here in Hawaii, isn't closely connected to the data using the the, the methods that are provided. Um, let's see, yeah, here's another uh, from the. Uh, Atlas <laughs> uh, data, you know, your request may be throttled if you make too many in a short time. Um, and uh, this was actually, so Atlas uh, published a set of light curves from variable stars to the same archive uh, back in 2018. And the total data set is 29 gigabytes in size. Uh, took me five days to download that 29 gigabytes. So, you know, what I, what I, <laughs> What we've done is, uh, you know, we've kind of used the standard architectures and tools that uh, that other people have developed, uh, data transfer nodes that are, you know, well tuned to uh, 100 gigabit uh, network connections, and uh, we've placed one in Baltimore. We've got one, two here in Hawaii. We put one in Japan in Tokyo, and um, and then we've, uh, you know found that there's some additional steps maybe that we can do with these data transfer nodes. Um, and that really is what we're, where we're focused now is, you know, how can we leverage our campus, regional and national cyber infrastructure? Uh, how can to distribute, you know, data that's been siloed? How can we democratize access? Um, and I think a big part of this is also how do we do outreach to the user community of this data? So they know how to find data that's available and how to access it. And then I think finally, you know, I'm particularly interested. I've done a lot of uh, machine learning, you know, AI, uh, you know, image processing or anomaly detection or whatever, learning these things with Jupyter Notebooks. And it's always, you know, MNIST digits or, uh, you know, cats and dogs or whatever it is. But, you know, it, it's it's never astronomy data. It's, it's never like, you know, I, I've never actually taken a workshop where we did like galaxy morphology, even though that does actually exist out there. Um, and, uh, you know, variable star light curves, there's all sorts of really interesting applications for astronomy data, but, uh, yeah, and people love astronomy. It's a great outreach opportunity, you know. So, okay, so, so some of our resources here at the IFA, so, you know, kind of what do these uh, computing, computational resources look like? Uh, the IFA kind of combining Assassin and Atlas and PanStars and other resources. We have about 5,000 CPU cores in our data center and over seven petabytes of data total. Uh, most of that is raw image data, raw and reduced. You know, see so you have this doubling effect of the raw and then the reduced. Um, the uh, COA cluster is our, our UH campus cluster. That's uh, a pretty robust cluster. Uh, and then, um, you know, we've been collaborating with National Research Platform and planning to do more uh, to leverage uh, Kubernetes and uh, and really participate in, I think, what their excellent approach to democratizing, uh, you know, bring your own hardware and have access uh, that's scalable to scalable resources in sort of a uh, <laughs> private community research cloud, I guess. Um, and I think uh, one thing I'll highlight about that is is that the 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 patterns for using the computing resources that uh, that uh, are Kubernetes-based, Docker-based, and, and NRP, that NRP uses, um, really prepare people who are learning how to do work in that environment for uh, being able to use your cloud compute infrastructure, Google Cloud Platform, and, and AWS, and so on. So I think that's a, a, a virtuous thing. Um, Open Science Grid, uh, we're, we're looking how, how we can make our data accessible through Open Science Grid. And then with this recent NSF uh, pilot project called National AI Research Resource, um, we're reaching out to them to also make sure that uh, the efforts that have already been done don't get uh, disconnected from efforts to pr provide uh, 
computational resources to, to researchers who are interested in doing applied AI research. Uh, of course, the you know regional clusters in at universities around the country, and of course, uh, then we have DOE labs, NCAR, NASA have compute resources, and we've done less uh, really with you know DOE and NCAR and NASA, but uh, I think those are are relevant as well. Um, I want to highlight an example of what I think uh, somebody at the IFA who's done a very good job of trying to build out a service that does provide um, access to their data uh, at scale. And uh, this is a, a light curve download service, and it's been designed uh, to handle uh, high volume queries um, with uh, you know, aggressive parallelism and a distributed uh, database and distributed cluster behind it. Um, they, they serve 103 million light curves each one a discrete object in the sky. And what is a light curve is, you know, how bright is it over time? So you get a curve, a plot of changes in brightness over time. And this is used for, for supernovae. It's useful for, um, for, you know, variable stars and just you know, whatever whatever changes over time. Uh, so so this is a, um, they, they pre-compute the, the, the light curves and then they serve them at scale. And what we plan to do is take a snapshot once a quarter of their pre-computed light curves and make that available as a roughly 10 terabyte data set uh, that can be downloaded from Hawaii. And we're looking at uh, using uh, Open Science Data Federation and their uh, um, methods for uh, moving data around through data origins and data caches. So I think this is where people have really designed a system uh, to work at scale, and we need to see more of that. Um, I mentioned our data transfer nodes, uh, two, two Hawaiian islands, Tokyo and Maryland. Um, and we've tried to make these very, you know, not just globus, but definitely globus, but also, you know, a bunch of other ways to uh, move data around. And we've used really all of these at one point or another for different projects. So, you know, we've sort of tuned these DTNs so that they uh, can be used by anybody. Um, and one particular use pattern, I, I, I don't know how, how many people use BGFS uh, out there, but uh, we've, we've gotten good results using BGFS as a uh, distributed uh, storage system. And uh, what we're able to do is mount our BGFS storage uh, onto the data transfer node so that uh, the cluster storage can be exposed to these uh, transfer methods uh, very easily. Um, and that's been super useful. And then uh, right now we're working on, um, and uh, Jason and Ken both uh, consulted with us to help us kind of think through this, but uh, we're uh, purchasing two all flash 100 gig DTNs. Ours are getting pretty old and uh, you know they rely heavily on spinning disk. And it turned out that, uh, that the disk IO was really the limiting factor on bandwidth. So we're, we're hoping that we can um, see some higher uh, throughput rates by going all flash. A couple of uh, quick examples. Uh, so we had a new uh, postdoc, uh, and she had done a bunch of uh, uh, simulations uh, at Max Planck and uh, needed to transfer her data here to the cluster in Hawaii. And uh, and so you know we used the data transfer nodes to uh, transfer the data. And, um, you know, it, I think, performed pretty well. Uh, um, it could be better, but, uh, you know, it was uh, certainly for them, it was uh, it was successful. And uh, uh, that there st she's still uh, transferring more data uh, from Max Planck. So this is something that we don't do regularly, but we do do, um, you know, repeatedly. Uh, another example of kind of an operational use of our data transfer nodes is our Atlas project that takes a subset of their observations of solar system objects. And so when they're looking for asteroids, they see comets, they see asteroids, they see you know anything that's inside the solar system that's moving. And so they take that data and they send it to NASA's planetary data system, which is the NASA archive, happens to also be in Baltimore, but at University of Maryland, um, where uh, people can go to access solar system data. So uh, initially, they just couldn't 
get the volume of data they had uh, to planetary data system. So we, we kind of came up with this convoluted uh, mechanism where uh, Atlas uses NFS to mount their storage onto our data transfer node. And then we use the 100 gig uh, network and our data transfer node here in Hawaii and in Baltimore at max to transfer the data. Um, and uh, yeah, 282 megabytes per second. And then uh, they do a separate transfer for the last mile from the DTN in Baltimore uh, to um, uh, the planetary data system. And notice that that throughput is capped at 75 megabytes. So, you know, they're getting uh, about a quarter of the bandwidth over that last mile connection, which sort of, again, illustrates how we can move data from Hawaii to Baltimore faster than we can move it from Baltimore to Baltimore, which is, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure how to crack the nut of sort of getting some of these legacy archives to think in terms of having bigger um, pipes, uh, but it's a problem we run into. And then something kind of similar, uh, the Assassin Project, the, the data from the telescopes that are all around the world flow to Ohio State University. And then we have a mirror here in Hawaii where we suck every night, we pull the data from Ohio State uh, over to Hawaii. And initially we needed to initialize the system with all of the historical data that was at uh, Ohio State. And uh, once again, uh, they were getting like, you know, really low uh, transfer rates. And uh, so we worked with OSU to get a 10 gig connection that uh, was on the DMZ and was not running through their firewall. And then we're able to actually, uh, you know, move this data um, successfully. And this is a this is a nightly, you know, regular transfer. Now it's happening. Um, yeah. So, kind of going back to, uh, well, here's another example with uh, NCAR and the uh, uh, HAO High Altitude Observatory in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, I was working on a project uh, with AI for this and for what's called Stokes inversion, and um, was interested in, uh, well, wrote an NSF proposal that did not get funded. And so then we were like, well, you know, one of the criticisms was, well, you didn't really have, uh, you know, some evidence that this was going to work. And so we thought, well, okay, how could we make, how could we do a little small project that would show that this has merit? And, um, and so the, it, the uh, in, uh, the High Altitude Observatory maintains an archive of satellite-based images of the sun from the Hinode satellite. Uh, and uh, the, so I was able to R-sync the data from their site in Boulder to our data transfer node here in Hawaii, and then train a machine learning algorithm and do a proof of concept that, hey, this actually um, you know works. And uh, we were able to then write a new proposal that was uh, specifically for the DKIST, the new, the world's largest solar telescope is now operating on Haleakala here in Maui uh, called DKIST. And we were able to uh, get an award funded to do more machine learning specifically to support DKIST. And that actually involved running simulations at uh, uh, in Cheyenne on the NCAR uh, cluster there, supercomputer there. Um, and uh, we have a hundred, 20 terabytes of simulated cubes of the sun's atmosphere uh, that we're using for this project, which there again, we used our data transfer nodes to transfer the 120 terabytes of simulation cubes at Boulder uh, here to Hawaii for us to do the machine learning parts here locally. Um, so, okay, one last bit to talk about, and that's kind of how we see the data transfer node concept where we, you know, we, we purchased four data transfer nodes and we put them kind of where we thought they would be useful. But when I heard about the Open Science Data Federation and this approach that I, I would just simply say is really a content distribution network, right? So it's like, oh, you have data or the O's, the blue O's here in this map are data origins. That's a place where there's data available. And then the red C's represent data caches. And these are cache points uh, where if there's data at an origin that's of interest, you can request it and it will automatically get cached uh, and flow uh, to a cache close close by you. Uh, and then, uh, you know, National Research Platform and Open Science Grid are able to then use 
that cached data as a data source and present it to you, for example, in a Docker container uh, for, for, for access for your, for your job. Uh, and I think this is a really elegant solution to this democratization of access. And uh, so we are working on our end to turn our DTNs into data origins. Uh, we recently had a, a COA store NSF grant that provided us with a, a petabyte set aside. So I think it was four or five petabytes of total storage for our campus cluster, but 20% uh, of it was set aside specifically for data federation and data distribution. And so we've integrated with the Open Science Data Federation to uh, to be able to have our essentially a petabyte of uh, kind of static storage of data sets. And we're working to, to put our uh, the most valuable astronomy data sets um, in bulk uh, where they can be accessed anywhere. Uh, and, and I think a key part of this is actually uh, like I, I've reached out to an astronomer who works with machine learning with galaxy clusters, uh, who's very interested in uh, working with PanStars data, uh, who's in Kentucky. And uh, and so I think that's a, like a great example of how can I help her uh, get her hands on the PanStars data without having to really do anything special such that anybody anywhere could repeat uh, the experiment that, uh, that she wants to do. Uh, I already talked about the uh, the Hinodi ten terabytes of data, which we then used um, and uh, um, led on to another um, spin four D. And so these are some of the data sets and sources and projects. So our our spin four D, we we take those simulated uh, solar atmospheres and then we run what's called a, St a Stokes inversion uh, and uh, and uh, we synthesize, essentially we, 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 we synth synthetically create the observable, right? So what would, what would a spectropolarimeter see if it was looking from the earth into the sun and looking at this simulated cube of atmosphere? And so for every pixel, um, you know, we produce what the, the polarimetry would look like. And then we can use that to train uh, machine learning models. And we have different codes that actually we can use to do those inversions or, and the synthesis. Um, Assassin, I mentioned their variable star light curves uh, data set, about 10 terabytes. Um, Atlas has a variable star light curves. Potentially, Atlas and PanStars could be distributing stacks of images. Uh, and this is something, again, where these highly valuable, high signal to noise images are not, they're here in our data center, but they're not where anybody can do science with them. And, uh, and we also have another telescope called Eukert that does uh, an infrared survey uh, that is a very nice complement to the PanStars data set because it's different filters of roughly the of overlapping parts of the sky. And then finally, we have a, we have a grad student uh, who's doing a very interesting uh, cosmological simulation. So, you know, Lambda CDM model, uh, but uh, with a kind of a different approach. Uh, that's that's uh, very interesting. And so we plan to provide these simulation re uh, results um, through OSDF. So to kind of summarize, uh, you know, we're working on how do we publish our astronomy data here in Hawaii through uh, the data origins that we have? Um, how do we uh, also publish data collections using Globus and, and uh, kind of existing uh, ways of accessing data sets? Um, we want to upgrade our 100 gig DTNs uh, to be all flash and, and see uh, potentially much higher throughput rates. We want to uh, federate local Kubernetes clusters uh, with the NRP, uh, develop some Jupyter notebooks to use for outreach that use astronomy data. Um, we're hoping that we can kind of do the above data uh, federation and integration with the NSF's uh, NAI, NAIR, they're saying, calling it NAIR. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, work on doing more integration internally with the DTNs to our various project storage. And that is it. Um, happy to entertain some dis some questions. And I see a couple in chat. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Kurt, for for going through all of that. Uh, I think we 
we addressed Davey's question on on which uh, tools you're using, all, all of them. Yeah. Uh, second uh, question there from Julio uh, was mostly about your your instruments in South South Africa. Uh, do you continue Do you continue to have those be shipped on hard drives, or have you been able to succeed in getting those to work with networks? Yeah. So good question. Uh, all of our incoming data is transferred over the network. So Chile, South Africa, um, Atlas plans to add Canary Islands, uh, Tenerife, and a fifth telescope in, in Tenerife. Uh, so all of all of the influx is uh, by uh, uh, the network. The the one exception I didn't talk about the event horizon. I saw Hans was on here. Uh, the event horizon telescope is is a uh, and Jen hi Jen uh, is a uh, uh, you know, multi telescope, it's kind of a multi-baseline uh, radio astronomy uh, um, observation uh, wh where they produce the first image of a, of a black hole. Uh, and this requires, um, you know, synchronous observations at multiple uh, radio telescopes. And radio telescopes uh, generate just phenomenal amounts of data to where even a hundred gig connection isn't really enough to do, you know, there are definitely things you could do if you have a hundred gig, uh, and I, we've talked with uh, with our friends at the uh, you know at RAO. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I think there's you know I know that there's interest in utilizing the network more. The highest value, if you think about uh, the way this this works, um, if you have you have kind of a synthetic aperture, right? So if you if imagine a telescope mirror. And then you carved away all of the mirror except a point on one side and a point on the other side of the mirror. So you had a little tiny mirror way over here and way over here. And, you know, maybe you have another one here and then you have a couple that fill in in the middle. And, and so there's no actual mirror. There's just these little tiny mirrors positioned around. So now put those distributed around the earth. And now you look out into space. The longest distance, the longest baseline there gives you the highest resolution image of whatever you're imaging. And there's an argument for having 100 gig connectivity or maybe 200 gig connectivity between those that long baseline high resolution path, uh, because there's some valuable information that you can get from that. Even if you still have to ship disks to get all the data somewhere for processing, there's definitely utility in having your long baseline points connected at high bandwidth. And I think that's an area that I know NRAO is interested in and that uh, we would certainly like to um, facilitate and I, maybe just just specifically for Jen and Hans, you know, I think that's where I would focus my efforts in terms of trying to get Event Horizon to utilize the network. Would be uh, talk to them, maybe not solve it for everywhere, but but try to identify the the locations that have the two locations that have the highest value, which probably Hawaii is one of them, and and then see if we can get uh, high bandwidth between there. Uh, but so so event horizon and radio, radio astronomy still ships disks from Hawaii and from other, elsewhere. All right. uh, and I see John has a question about uh, sense and auto goal. Yeah, uh, you know, John, we, we really have not uh, operationalized uh, auto goal. Uh, we've done some experiments and, and the experiments were kind of did not provide smoking gun, um, you know, oh, auto goals, you know, substantially better in, in some useful way uh, from an operational perspective. So, you know, our takeaway from doing those experiments was, well, it seems pretty much the same as our routed uh, uh, networks. And I think we just kind of have landed on uh, the ease of operationalizing, you know, the routed networks just uh, seems to work and bear fruit. And so we really haven't focused much effort on that. And I'm totally interested in like, I'm I'm no expert. Uh, Chris is on the call and he's actually the one who was, you know, who was involved in that. Um, and I think both Chris and I are open to further experimentation. And we have a fabric, if, if people know about fabric, we have a fabric uh, node here in Hawaii. And so I think that uh, moving maybe some of those auto goal experiments onto the fabric uh, infrastructure might be uh, a good idea, um, but certainly open to exploring that more and maybe talking more about 
you know, maybe we just don't understand what operationalizing that looks like. Yeah, well, so I, I didn't really, okay, so here's a good question about uh, cloud public, uh, using the cloud uh, for public data sets. Um, so to be fair to the Mikulski uh, archive at Space Telescope Science Institute, those those original disks that we shipped from Hawaii are at, at the end of their life. And, you know, they, are, they were faced with this question of, well, what do we do with these bits? Do we buy you know, all new disks, build a new cluster and move the bits from the old disks to the new disks. And they've decided to move things into the Amazon cloud. Uh, so they're well on their way to duplicating uh, initially the catalog data. So that 150 terabytes of catalog data to the Amazon uh, cloud. And I expect that they'll do the same with the images, but we haven't really heard yet. I haven't heard yet. Um, and here's my concern, is that if you spin up a, a Docker container on the computer, you know, my, my GPU node in my office or in the data center or on NRP or in Open Science Grid, what's your bandwidth? to that 150 terabytes of data at Amazon and how do you access, how do you make that data in Amazon? It strikes me that it's great to put it in Amazon, but you're kind of creating a vendor lock-in scenario where uh, you're gonna need to fire up an EC2 instance to efficiently process that data. And you know the same would go if you were putting it in Google Cloud uh, storage. Um, you, you, you know, the obvious thing is now you're kind of locked into using GCP to access the data. Um, Again, me, uh, I'm teachable. So if somebody knows an elegant way to access your data that's in, uh, you know, S3 buckets from uh, uh, from uh, you know NRP in a in a container, then I need to learn about that. Um, yeah. Yep. So so and and by the way, I would also say that what uh, Space Telescope is doing. Uh, by putting things in AWS is consistent with the path that I see NAIR following, right? So if you look at, if you go online and search for NAIR pilot and you go to their site, they have um, access to different um, uh, data sets that, uh, you know, are initial data sets uh, for NAIR. And I, uh, I think it would be terrific to make sure that somebody from Space Telescope reaches out to NSF, I'm happy to be a conduit for that conversation um, to make sure that uh, that those space tel that those uh, panstars and other data sets are getting um, exposed through the NIR uh, project. Right now, there was only one astronomy data set, and it was a uh, galaxy morphology data from Hugging Base uh, at NIR. And John, I see your comment in chat, so uh, I'll, I'll be at the NRP at five NRP, and so maybe we can talk a little bit about S three when, when I'm there. Uh, will, will you be there, John? I would assume he will be. This party, yeah. right? <laughs> I, actually, I actually had to cancel. Uh, oh no! Attending remotely again. Oh, okay. Well, hey, maybe we can we can still chat though. Yes. All right. Uh, well, good questions, everybody. Uh, if anybody does have any other questions or comments, certainly put them in chat or uh, raise your hand. I guess I'll I'll ask one more here, Kurt. Uh, you know, if you, if you could do sort of total success here, if money wasn't an object, uh, what does this look like? Does this look like going back and trying to re-architect a lot of the the portal systems themselves to make those more efficient or just trying to move data closer and closer to where the people are going to be or some combination of both? Uh, so I, I didn't talk about this, but I have a fabric experiment that I'm going to do. And it it might be, I, I would say there's room for some criticism for this approach. However, uh, the idea is kind of related to uh, a pub sub brokerage uh, uh, architecture that's being adopted, for example, for the LSST, and it's already been implemented as kind of a test for, I think, uh, ZTF and a couple other uh, surveys in astronomy. So the idea with LSST is that 
it's just going to be drinking from the fire hose. There's going to be so much data that it, it's just kind of intractable. And so they've uh, set up, I forget if it's five or seven, but there's some number of top level brokers that that focus, for example, oh, on solar system objects. So there'll be a broker that's just sucking out the subset of things that are moving inside the solar system that LSST sees. Then you can subscribe to your broker if you're interested in comets like we are. I'm working on a project here where we're trying to suck up all the comets. So, okay, we want to we want a, a broker. We want to subscribe to that broker and we want to declare this is what we want. So I've been thinking a lot from to do a fabric experiment kind of for PanStars or maybe Atlas where we say, can you declare the data that you want and then sort of orchestrate the workflow again with uh, all the data machine learning kind of a uh, objective right so that i can stream data from some source with pre pre selection on my data that i've defined in advance and then that data comes to me and gets cached uh so i you know i can do some small experiments small scale experiments to get my my uh, uh, pre-processing defined correctly. The pre-processing runs close to the data, but then I get my pre-processed data as a stream over the internet, and um, and now I can now I have it locally cached, and I can go repeat my iterative machine learning experiments. So I'm I'm really interested in exploring that pattern to see whether it's actually effective or not. Okay. And it looks like John was uh, describing uh, one of the UCAR products that may be able to, to work a little bit like what you're describing. Yeah, I'll, I'll check that out. Thanks, John. Yeah, yeah we actually have, have it. The, the DKIS telescope has a similar problem, you know, where it's ultimately drinking from the fire hose when they're observing. Yeah, this is a pub sub subscription system. It, it works quite nice for all the raw weather data products in okay. your time. Yeah. And I, and I would maybe, you know, one last comment. I, I think we have a lot to learn from the uh, high energy physics, you know, Atlas people who move big, big data around in serious ways. So I think, you know, a lot of the DOE people, you know, are kind of familiar with that. Um, I look at genomics data, and I think that is a discipline that grew up in the, you know, in kind of the big data era. Uh, the big data was an inherent part of of you know genomics and 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 so uh, they seem more mature. I think astronomy's had a little bit of difficulty transitioning from sort of the classical approach to the big data world. And um, uh, yeah, and I and I think weather and climate seems to also be an area that's gotten farther um, on you know getting their arms around um, working with big data. So you know. And I think there's just a lot of need for outreach within the astronomy community to help like people become aware <laughs> of tools that are available and that do work at scale. Appreciate okay. everybody joining. Yeah. Do we have any more questions? Looks like we may be maybe done. So certainly thank you again, Kurt, for going over it. Uh yep. If you send me a copy of your slides, I'll make sure those get posted. And just a note for everybody else, uh, we're on sort of a spring break. We're not going to have another talk until April 4th. Uh, and we're going to have uh, Michael Benedito from American Museum come in and talk a little bit about their infrastructure. Uh, we wanted to try to get one last CC Star talk in before the deadline. So he's going to be focusing a little bit on the upgrades that they've made to the museum over the past couple of years uh, that were supported by that program. So hope everybody has a good couple of weeks and we'll uh, send out the slides and the, the videos and we'll uh, talk to everybody soon. Bye all. Bye bye.